So good evening to you. We're going to continue this conversation on the conquest of space, and we're going to be looking at the legal, historic, geopolitical issues relating to this. And we have two specialists who I'm delighted to be able to welcome here. On the set, we have Isabel, Isabel Surbez Verger, who is a geographer and who is also one of the very rare French speaking geographers, if not the only. French speaking geographer who has worked for quite a long time on the conquest of extraterrestrial, circumterrestrial space. We don't have a good word for it. In English, there's a word called outer space that is fantas fantastic to talk about the spheres beyond our Earth. So we tend to talk about extra circumterrestrial space, if I translate literally from the space. And we're going to be talking about the conquest of space looking to understand the historic and geopolitical issues related to this conquest. And from Adelaide also, we have Alice Gorman. Alice Gorman, who's delighting us with her presence. So Isabel is head of research at the CNRS, the French Research Institute, and Alice Gorman is in charge of spatial archaeology in Adelaide on the south coast of Australia. So thank you so much for being present here with us. And we'll be talking with you a bit further down the line about what spatial archaeology can potentially be all about. It's a discipline that might seem rather strange, but no, it's a very important, very interesting discipline. So to get started, maybe we could refer back to what Kim Stanley Robinson said earlier. And I thought it was very interesting to be able to launch this debate when Kim was talking about Aurora and talking about the fact that he wanted to show that humanity wasn't destined for the stars. He said that he had, it was unbelievably unacceptable to imagine that humanity could conquer the solar system, the universe and the stars. And nevertheless, this being said, the drive for this conquest is still there. It's even stronger than it was previously. And yet the actions to guarantee, to guarantee that this action takes place, yes, it's still out out there with many different actors and so maybe this driving force this energy energy says a lot more about us than it does about the stars around us it says a lot more about us on this earth in this complex existence and so i think it serves the purpose maybe to look back to the history of the space conquest. And Isabel, if you don't mind, can we maybe uh, set the scene for this discussion by referring back to history? We all know the history vaguely, but we only know the epic part of the tale. Um, thanks to the storytelling that exists, but we don't know much at all in detail about the long-standing complex story and the much more subtle story. Um, so could you please paint a broad portrait of a certain number of phases? And before we then pass the floor over to Alice, would you mind highlighting just a few of the main actors, the main geopolitical actors, at least initially speaking, because we're talking about geopolitical actors who came to the fore at a given moment so that we can then progress. Yes, you're quite right. So the question of occupying space and conquering space, first uh, and foremost, it's a very recent question. And uh, we uh, know a little about the story, but we don't know much about the story if you think about it in more detail. So there are probably some people in this room who come from the 57 generation, so uh, the Sputnik generation, and then we have other people who are from the Apollo generation. And then I think today among some of our students here, we have some of our students who, when I talk about, about Apollo, they say your parents probably taught you about Apollo. They said, no, it's our grandparents who taught to us about Apollo, not my parents. So uh, this enables me to gauge uh, the, the history of conquering space is very close for a lot of people or very present in people's mind. And it's a very part of the distant past for a lot of other people. So this uh, raises questions as to how dreams uh, come about. And you talked about this idea of whether um, man is destined to leave Earth and to go further. And the people who defend this idea today uh, are Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk more particularly, so people who are 50 year old and uh, people who somewhere along the line who think that conquering Mars is, Mars is something that they dreamt about when they were young in the same way as we dreamt about conquering 
the moon. Now, I'm not sure that young generations today who have a lot of different challenges, technological challenges, for example, uh, and who are going to be more and more familiar with robotics and artificial intelligence, I don't know if they have the same need to send people uh, to distant planets to make sure that uh, their thirst for exploration uh, is quenched. And if we think about the history of uh, conquering space, I think there are two main uh, orientations. The first orientation is the Cold War, the Cold War with more particularly the nuclear uh, uh, wars and also s where spatial activity was very close to l'entité nucléaire en quelque sorte à la fois nuclear activity because for astronauts and astronomers and astrophysics physicists uh, uh, don't forget that that's a lot of uh, rockets on nuclear machines so for the first people who were interested in space uh, mainly uh, physicists and uh, astronomers and then you have the United States and the Soviet Union who took a great interest in space one of them uh, for spying purposes and to map uh, space out because uh, uh, obviously you know that satellites don't necessarily respect land borders or earth borders for different technical re reasons because when your satellite is in orbit then obviously the earth is spinning around as it always does and in fact it's the uh, earth which defines the limits of the satellite somewhere along the line so basically the idea was to have a vision of the uh, potential uh, enemy's territory that's for the Soviet Union and then uh, for the Soviet Union uh, basically uh, they had uh, uh, this wish to threaten the United States with the nuclear missiles and uh, to uh, uh, have a deterrent effect. Uh, so there are some different streams, these very different streams. The nuclear stream, uh, which is uh, not a, at all peaceful. In fact, this is uh, the expression of, uh, of rivalry between these two countries in space. And then you have the other stream, uh, which is uh, uh, the physical stream, where people are trying to understand uh, the exchanges between the Earth, the ocean, uh, atmosphere, and space. So basically, we've always uh, uh, vied between these two streams, and there's a third stream as well, which is the role of uh, humankind in all of this. So if uh, we uh, think about the history of conquering space, we know that human presence uh, um, uh, punctuates the major events right through to landing on the moon, and uh, it starts with the, the Soviet exploits, and then you had the first satellite, then you had the first uh, uh, photo of the dark side of the moon, and that was in uh, 61, then you have the first man in space, and then you have a whole series of exceptional events, uh, the first man on the moon, then the first woman on the, the first woman in space. This was very extraordinary as well. But uh, the first man uh, was uh, a fighter pilot, and the, 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 the woman was a specialist in textiles, and obviously uh, the, the, the flight wasn't the same for both of them. And then you have all of the other things that went on around uh, that, and right through to the day when Kennedy in his electoral campaign said, well, uh, the first man in space or the first man on the moon uh, mustn't uh, be called Igor, uh, 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 <laughs> Ivan maybe, but in fact this didn't really make Kennedy very happy and uh, therefore Kennedy decided that uh, uh, he had to accelerate the big scientific products so as to uh, uh, drum up the resources and to give people faith in their scientific knowledge and their technological knowledge and capacity. Also there was the context of decriminalization at the time and this was a big challenge for the US at the time uh, because the US wanted to show itself as being the best regime and the best model and this is when Kennedy decided to uh, start conquering the moon and this was absolutely extraordinary and then as of the 1970s uh, we changed gears slightly progressively other states apart from the United States and the Soviet Union started to uh, show their spatial skills and uh, spatial applications became uh, increasingly popular or um, there are more and more of these uh, spatial applications right through to the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union with with uh, crude uh, flights, uh, uh, so only uh, uh, the Soviet Union kept these long-term flights, and then the United States uh, ended up uh, having a complete uh, hegemony over this, uh, and India and China uh, were only able to launch satellites, but mainly it was the US. I don't like using the word colonization, but they developed different spatial applications, which were uh, very varied, civilian applications, but also a military uh, uh, applications. This is what we discovered in the Gulf War. And then the last 
next major change was in the noughties uh, at the start of the year 2000. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, is now in the history books. In 2003, you've got the decision that was taken to make uh, and uh, to launch the James Webb telescope. And it uh, was launched in 2021, I think at the end of 2021. So you can imagine it took 18 years, 18 years to do this with all this uh, technology, uh, which had uh, really evolved uh, considerably. Remember what a smartphone was like 18 years ago. We didn't even know a smartphone would exist now. So uh, uh, this was a turning point from a technological point of view, but also because the United States uh, is still the big space power, but there are new stakeholders coming to the fore. And in 2003, this is when we um, uh, saw the first crewed Chinese flight. Uh, so then things continued and we saw the increasingly important role played uh, by space as a place to store data, the role of information, for example, which is one of the reasons why we have Elon Musk's constellation. And then uh, you have in parallel to this, you have a new stakeholder, a new actor like China and India to a certain extent, and they uh, want to appear as being space powers as well. So that's basically a quick history of space. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's very important to resituate these uh, big milestones of history. So now I want to talk to Alice Gorman because uh, you are a specialist. You're a, a space archaeologist. Uh, so this is a very specific uh, feature of yours, space archaeology. So you take this idea very seriously, the fact that space is inhabited, if you like, by all of these human artifacts and even by human beings. And basically what you try and do is to study these different artifacts in space uh, sometimes. The size varies greatly. Uh, you study these big objects which are flying around and these micro objects as well. You study all of these artifacts like an archaeologist would study uh, objects on Earth. And uh, uh, the idea is uh, uh, not just to observe uh, technology or to observe matter uh, used to build these artifacts or to produce these artifacts, but also you uh, think about what these artifacts say about our culture, say about our societies, say about political uh, issues, and say about humanity, and say about this conquering of space. And so uh, I think you're going to explain this, and you're going to explain how, based on these artifacts in space, how you uh, uh, develop critical thought with regard to this uh, uh, spatial epic, which is very often uh, presented as being these male, white, uh, dominant astronauts, and this critique of uh, spatial epochs and the epic, which uh, enables you to highlight the cultural challenges and the cultural stakes behind this extension into space. This is true. So, um this is my field is space archaeology. Uh, but before I actually talk a bit more about that, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains uh, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, acknowledge their strong cultural and ongoing ties to the heritage of the lands, waters and skies. And I also extend my respects to the traditional owners of all the lands that the audience is joining us from today. Uh, so yes, space archaeology, as Michelle said, basically I'm using the same techniques we use on Earth to analyze human behavior through the artifacts that have been discarded or left behind uh, to find out something about how humans uh, engage with and interact with outer space. And Putting this in context of Isabel's uh, historical uh, summary, I think something that's really interesting is that before the Second World War, a lot of the conceptions of how people would go into space and live in space were based around families. So they had this idea that whole communities would move into space habitats in Earth orbit or would move to the moon. During the Second World War, these visions of space were basically supplanted by rockets as weapons of war and space became a military enterprise. So, so we do have the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which makes very clear that space is to be used for the benefit of all humanity and is for peaceful purposes. But this treaty was developed in the context of completely militarised space. So all of those visions of space as as a whole of humanity, a family-based society thing, have, have been supplanted by uh, white male military colonialist 
conceptions and we're having to drag them back now. Uh, a lot of people are critical of the Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Agreement which followed it. Uh, and one of the reasons they're critical of it is because they say sharing the benefits of outer space with all of humanity is difficult or impossible. I completely disagree with this position. But given that space has developed, as Isabel said, through all these decades of the Cold War, it was uh, putting people on the moon initially was a Cold War activity driven by um, objectives of, of nationalist prestige, of demonstrating the superiority of a particular ideology over another one. We have to hold on to those treaties in order to return to that pre-Second World War vision where space uh, is really for everybody. And c coming to some of the things that Kim Stanley Robinson was talking about in the previous uh, session, I... I'm as keen to go to the stars or go to the moon as anyone else, but I would disagree with the idea that this is a basic human instinct. I think this idea that uh, we have to, to move out of the solar system, maybe eventually to exoplanets, is something that's situated in a very particular moment in history, uh, being driven by uh, particular ideas. So we don't have to go to the stars. It's not necessarily something, you know, as an archaeologist, I work in space, but I'm also interested in those deep human trajectories. So these are not urges that um, are, are based on paleolithic um, human social behaviour or desires. Uh, for a start, we don't know any of this stuff and we have no evidence to suggest that this was ever an ambition um, of humans um, in the deep past. So I think we have an interesting tension between all of the ways in which space is fascinating to us and in which it presents something exotic, maybe an escape route, uh, maybe a place where you can uh, leave behind the complexities of contemporary human life. Uh, so all of those desires, and I, that I think they very are, are much are desires, um, in contrast with the impossibility almost of doing that, the impossibility of actually we have none of the technologies needed to survive long-term in space at the moment, literally none of them. Merci beaucoup, uh, Alice Gorman. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Alice Gorman. So we'll come back to that later and we'll come back to all of the points that you've already mentioned in that uh, first intervention. But I'd like to come back to Isabel and I'd like to come back to something that you said or cited in an article that you published recently in a journal called Constructive. And basically, uh, in this uh, article, you analyze the question of ownership of space, appropriation. And when I say ownership of space, I talk about land ownership or uh, space ownership. And you cite a very surprising sentence uh, uh, of a great uh, geographer, Gottman, who uh, six years before space was opened up, so in the 1950s, uh, in the years before uh, space was opened up, he wrote the following, uh, the policies of states so are part of the geographic space. So this is the space which is accessible to human beings. We have the geography of seas. Um, men know how to navigate on seas. And since they've known how to fly, we are starting to see a geography of the air. And now the day when they decide to colonize the moon or another planet, uh, the geography will have to extend to these spaces, which are still uh, the realm of astronomers. So this is very uh, gripping. And this shows that Gottman had really understood the challenges uh, behind ownership or uh, actually uh, getting to grips with space, a uh, space uh, is quite equivocal as a concept because uh, space, there are no limitations to space, there are no boundaries, There's, it's not uh, it's not a geographical, physical space, uh, uh, it's not something we can cut up into little pieces, and yet, and yet, uh, you have the geopolitics of this space, uh, so I'm not only talking about outer space, but also I'm talking about the moon, and also these political issues behind all of these things. Man, uh, uh, yes, what you've underscored is very, very important. And I put a sentence by Gottman in my thesis because, in fact, what is forgotten often is that 
space also has an addition area that is not the moon. Gottman doesn't talk specifically about space, he talks about the moon and that's very interesting. And I think to a certain extent he pinpoints or highlights a very relevant aspect. For example, when you're a geographer, when you want to think of a new milieu, a new environment, because that's what he's talking about. In fact, we can imagine, we think about the air, we can think about the seas, but it's impossible to think about space itself. He can't think of space. He thinks of a point of arrival to a certain extent. So he thinks of a planet. He imagines a celestial body on which things can take place, geology, where people can come together as if it's an eighth continent or something in relation to the Earth. And at the time, you could find quite a few analyses whereby it was said, well, at the end of the day, we finished exploring the Earth. So now we're going to explore what potentially is something that has been issued from the Earth. And the parts of the orbit, intrinsically speaking, were not of any direct interest to Gottman because Gottman was a political geographer. That was his original theme. And Anna Herent, for example, when it comes to the human being. She talks about Sputniks. So well and truly, you've got this change in the 1950s, this sudden awareness that some people had as to the fact that, yes, there was a new way of thinking of the world and thinking of ourselves. And it's true that space, where we don't have any particular definition, we talk about 100 kilometres because we consider that beyond 100 kilometres, the atmosphere um, is very different, but it's all very vague. And then there's another definition whereby we say that um, you have to be able to have an object that orbits around the Earth. It has to be able to turn around the Earth without being attracted by the Earth's traction. And this takes us to 150 to 200 kilometres. And then afterwards, of course, you've got infinite space and way beyond that. So what I'm basically saying is that this idea of the physicality of space that didn't really exist. Next, when it comes to circulating in space, you have to be able to define the orbit and what it is. So I would argue that when today we read that space is clogged up, overpopulated, there is, there is junk and waste everywhere. And of course, we've all seen the photos in relation to the Russian satellites, or you've got the Earth that shows all kinds of little objects that look like waste. Well, in reality, there are eight massive distances. The scale is not what we imagine at all, but simply space for the most part is empty. I'm not calling into question the fact that there are hundreds and thousands of pieces of junk and that it's a problem for circulating in space. And on top of that, the international community has set in place a certain number of procedures to manage this waste. Yes, you're absolutely right. And we're going to do so even more. We're going to try and also introduce responsible behaviours and uh, traffic rules in space. There are a certain number of studies being performed on these subjects today. So basically, the subject of waste, the, spatial aid, the space agencies, they really do want to limit this waste. Globally speaking, we, we're referring to all kinds of waste. A satellite that is no longer in operation, for example, a, a nut, a boat that is flying around space, um, that kind of thing. But this waste, this junk, after a certain amount of time, it depends on the altitude, it depends on its weight, but it will be drawn to Earth and will burn in the atmosphere. So at the current time, you've got waste that disappears and then new waste uh, that appears after it's disappeared. So there's no um, continuous pollution, let's say, because part of the waste burns. But to go back to tangible elements, in 1957, from 1957 to today, I don't know whether you you can imagine how many objects have been launched into space, artificial objects, but there have been 12,000, so that is not that many. And where we see something very different is when Elon Musk suddenly talks about constellations of 43,000 satellites that are going to be put into orbit within the space of the next three years. So here, we're suddenly seeing a phenomenal change in the way in which we're going to occupy space. But at the same time, the geostational orbit, where you've got the different satellites that show you the pictures of the Earth, the weather satellites, they're at a height of 36,000 kilometres. Um, and if you start performing very complex uh, cal calculations, it's 210,000 kilometres away. And then you've got a circumference of 210,000 kilometres. And you've got very few satellites, ACH satellites in that orbit. So the problems mainly are problems in relation to frequencies, um, but it's not at all 
a problem in relation to literal waste flying around. We're not talking about a clogged up space or congestion space, if I use our standard vocabulary. And remember this picture of Apollo, and I'm sure you can all remember this. Um, it was a very tiny, distant Earth that you could see from Apollo. And obviously, between Apollo and the Earth, there was nothing. It was just a void, a vacuum, which is the main characteristic of the, the spatial environment, even if, of course, there are now traffic flows. So we said the space is immense, it is empty, and the scales are massive. Nevertheless, Alice Gorman, you specifically study human life, human life in space, notably in a project that is currently in progress, I believe, called the International Space Station Archaeological Project. In other words, you're attempting to study how, concretely speaking, we are trying to inhabit uh, the orbit stations, for example, and you do take very seriously this life, and also you attempt to understand exactly how astronauts uh, are trying to adapt to this kind of habitat designed by engineers in the aim of optimizing potentially life that's going to be very, very difficult with all kinds of techniques and routines that have to be implemented. And you show how gradually these astronauts, notably those who stay in space for a long, long time and on the spot, how they try and get used to this situation and accommodate themselves and adapt to it, how the nationalities of the astronauts, their genre, colors to a certain degree the way in which they live. That's also what you're talking about when you talk about the archaeology of this space, and it teaches us a great deal about the way in which we live on Earth, does it not? This is um, what Michelle's talking about is the International Space Station Archaeological Project, which I've been running with my colleague, Professor Justin Walsh from Chapman University in California since about 2015. We've just had a most exciting development. So in the last week, we uh, started the first archaeological fieldwork ever to take place outside the Earth. So we're very excited about this. Uh, and this is where we're getting the crew who are currently on the International Space Station to systematically photograph uh, sample squares every day for two months so that we can track the movement of objects around the station. And one of the aims behind this project is to look at the ways uh, crew in a microgravity environment uh, use objects to not just do practical things but to adapt their social behaviour to these very particular circumstances as well. And we're very much interested in just in, in what's overlooked, what's forgotten and not seen, what's not recorded uh, in terms of, of, you know, just minor everyday things. So uh, um, one of, aspect of this too is adapting to microgravity by creating spots of temporary or very restricted gravity, specifically by using simple materials, Velcro, the same ones we use on Earth, exactly the same, Velcro, Ziploc or Snaplock bags, uh, clips, bungee cords, uh, hand and foot rails. So, so these are the same, whether you're using them in full Earth gravity or whether you're in microgravity. And on the International Space Station, uh, these very simple objects actually stand in for the lack of gravity. You use them to fix objects in place. And the way I'm thinking about it, you're, you also use them to uh, develop or provide the structure for memory. So I'm interested in exploring the, the intersections between gravity and memory, how this operates on Earth, how it works in space when you remove uh, gravity as a, a you know, ubiquitous background uh, quality or affordance. And ultimately, this, I think, will enable us to look back on the Earth to look at how gravity has structured human culture and behaviour. So there is relevance to this, to how we design and develop space habitats going forward. And at the moment, there are a number of private space stations being developed. Uh, the US has set up the Artemis Accords and is building uh, an, a lunar orbiting space station or planning to build a lunar orbiting space station. There's expectations that people will be on the surface of the moon maybe sometime in the next 10, 20 years. So 
archaeology actually has something to offer to how you design these places for humans to live. Uh, you know, archaeologists are concerned with material culture and we have this very long um, uh, history. We, you know, we look at how humans use materials uh, practically and socially, you know, from the Paleolithic, from 3.3 million years ago to the present. So I think there's uh, a unique perspective there and we are very excited about doing the first archaeology in space it's only been going a week so we don't have any conclusions yet uh, but hopefully when we've done some more analysis uh, in in a month or a couple of months we might be able to say completely new things that no one ever knew before about how crew make those adaptations to everyday life in microgravity Oh, wow, yes, it's just so interesting to imagine exactly how you can use space as a mirror, as an inhabited space. And you know that at the urban school, we talk a great deal about habitability. Um, we ha you can have extreme conditions, but Alex Gorman, what you're showing is that despite these extreme conditions that can be sometimes very similar to laboratory life in the Antarctic, as Kim Stanley Robinson was saying, there are tactics and also techniques that enable human beings to try and compose a way of behaving in these very, very difficult environments. Earlier on also, Isabel, you mentioned the photo, the very well-known photo of the Earth seen from Apollo, and it will soon be the 50th anniversary in December of 2022. This photo was taken um, half a century away, and we will celebrate this at the Urban School of Lyon, because this picture picture is a very precious picture to us and we all remember that the different expeditions to the moon were expeditions that placed the astronauts in very uncomfortable situations. The moon modules were basically made of DIY technical things and today we see that the moon once again is clearly becoming a challenge but this time around with totally different resources and totally different ambitions because we talked about SpaceX, we talked about Elon Musk, some people now even talk very openly about saying loud and clear that it's going to be possible to set foot on the moon and maybe even to terraform Mars, to convert Mars into a habitable space. Um, we're even talking about it for the moon with new techniques, new powers, new designs, spatial designs that Alice is also studying, uh, borne forward by certain sizable countries. I repeat, the moon is becoming a major challenge challenge, a challenge of interest from a geo, geographical perspective, geopolitical perspective. How do you analyze this? How do you analyze this return to the moon as being one of the main concerns of those who show an interest in space? Because it's not necessarily something that was as easy as all that to forecast a few years ago, where the moon became a bit of a nostalgic object that told an epic story, but an epic story from the past. The moon has become trendy again. Yes, the moon has become trendy again. But to go back to what Gottman said, he said that the moon is the only natural satellite for the Earth. So if you like, basically when you want to undertake um, to create a new form of habitat and to inhabit an area and that you want to set foot in that area, and you talked about the article on uh, land management, it doesn't mean that we will own uh, the, the moon, for example, but we talk about going there. So going to the moon is all about a very unusual logical process. Look at China. China is the very first time that they've deposited objects on the moon since uh, 2018. And so China basically is now entering into a catch-up period, a catch-up period in relation to uh, actions that have been taken by other countries. Um, the space world is a hostile world. It's hard to gain control over the objects. So I would say that the roadmap for China is quite practical. It's just to check exactly what the others know how to do and then to try and do it in turn. So China is basically coming on, coming back to the moon. And the question for the United States was to work out, well, as Obama did, Obama declared, well, at the end of the day for the United States, we've turned the page. Um, we've been to the moon. We went to the moon in 1969. 69, and now we need to do something else, something different, or like the Soviet Union 
and Russia, they're all a bit embarrassed in relation to this moon. They've already brought back samples thanks to automatic systems, even if they've never put a man on the moon. And to a certain extent, what's interesting and entertaining in terms of the American history, they don't have a major space program today. And when they don't have a major space program, mm -hmm. they start to say how close and near the moon is. And everybody does it. There are lots and lots of astronauts that said, no, 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 we don't want to go back to the moon. We're going to await, we're going to waste time when it comes to going to Mars. But when it comes to traveling to Mars, the budgets are so consequential and the deadlines are so, so long. It's hard for the politicians. There's such a timeline between making the decision, paying the money, and then not being there to see when people land on the moon. And it's all very problematic. So spending money to go to Mars, um, it was just out of reach. And the NASA tried hand over foot, but they could never succeed. So if the Chinese go to the moon, if the, the Americans don't have a program for Mars, well, there, there aren't many destinations where you can send humankind. So everybody would just revert back to the moon. And it's very interesting to see the way in which the American Congress has promoted this idea of going back to the moon as being something that is necessary for the United States. The states have to go there because China's going to go there, but the states have already been there. So today, what is happening is I would say we're trying to give new colours to something that is old hat. And this new coloration, this new colour is to say, OK, we're now entering into a different phase where we're going to market, industrialise and normalise everything in relation to space. So now there are private entrepreneurs. You've got the myth of borders, the myth of the pioneer, of the innovator and so on and so forth. And so as a result, when it comes to the moon, well, we're going to look to extra resources, we're going to look to develop habitats, but to a certain extent it's potentially or very unlikely. The Artemis programme, for example, was relaunched by Trump, who simply wanted to obtain more legitimacy in terms of the projects he was presenting, and just at the end of his first term of office, he announced that the states were going to go to the moon right away in 2024, whereas it was totally unrealistic um, because it's not possible to have such a short turnaround time and to make it feasible. So I would argue today, Biden, he's inherited uh, Trump's program. It's not a program that he deliberately chose. So we are going to go to the moon, but are we going to stay there? And what amount is going to be necessary to be able to stay on the moon? It's not as clear as all that. All of the studies that today talk about the possibility for private stakeholders to invest in the moon announced that it would take 20 years of public investment on a regular basis before the private stakeholders can do anything. And Elon Musk talks about colonies on Mars, but he doesn't talk about colonies on the moon. So this story of the relationship with the moon is very, very complicated. Alice Goldman. So, uh, obviously, I'm going to ask you about that, the question of the moon, because uh, uh, this is really at the heart of uh, one of what your concerns. Uh, you're uh, used to talking about this in your work, and you say in your work that uh, space archaeology enables us to show that using outer space and this use of outer space by human beings is uh, a clear expression of these uh, power struggles and these uh, inequalities uh, and injustices which exist uh, in Earth society, a very male-dominated world and uh, uh, excluding a large part of humanity with uh, a very white population in space and also the exploitation of uh, space which is kind of a pursuit of these uh, dominant relationships, uh, colonial relationships uh, that uh, uh, we had on Earth. Uh, so this has led you uh, to think a lot more about uh, and to take an interest in the question of the moon and also uh, you've signed a declaration, a declaration on the rights of the moon. So this declaration is intended to uh, pre preempt this uh, movement, movement, if you like, for this renewed interest in the moon as a possible resource uh, for economic exploitation and extraction. So I'd like you to say a few words, if you don't mind, about this uh, uh, spatial conquest which expresses these fundamental inequalities in human society, but also I'd like you to explain uh, the approach which has led to this uh, Declaration on the Rights of the Moon. Oh, absolutely. And I, I have to say I'm uh, extremely 
Uh, I'm proud of the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon, which I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about in a minute. But I also think Isabel has provided some really fascinating context for the moon because it's true, the US have already been there and in going to the moon they showed or they uh, made it a capitalist um, celestial body. And uh, thinking about what Isabel just said, they're having to do that again because China is one of the main competitors. So it is, again, a battle of ideologies. And this, these ideologies are expressed through material culture. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see what kind of material symbols are left behind on the moon this time, which, which brings me to thinking about all of this activity, this commercial activity on the moon. Uh, which has been discussed and is accelerating and enshrined in, in various pieces of national legislation now. Uh, so it's just become accepted that humans are going to the moon, are going to extract resources for use uh, there on, on the surface of the moon to, to create an economy and that this may be used to go on to Mars and there may be some benefits for Earth as well. So, so this has become such a strong narrative that there's... Um, not, not that much to balance it. And this was kind of the motivation behind a small group of us uh, thinking about this, thinking about the fact that we know what uh, resource extraction does to environments on Earth and most parts of the world have environmental management systems in place so that there is regard for um, doing the minimum amount of harm to natural environments and to ecologies and, and to human um well-being as well. But there's this idea, and, and, and Kim Stanley Robinson said this, that the moon is dead and you don't have to worry about it. There is nothing that can be destroyed there. There are no unique environmental values that have any meaning for anything. So I don't agree that the moon is dead because I don't think you have to have uh, a live thing somewhere uh, for it to be counted as living. The moon has an incredibly complex uh, geology and geomorphology, and it's in dynamic interchange with the rest of the solar system and the cosmos. It has active water cycles, which everyone's interested in the moment because they want that water. So I would argue that the moon is not dead, that it has extremely unique environments like the permanently shadowed regions where you have these two billion year old shadows, which to me is extraordinary, shadows that have never seen any light other than starlight. And if you think about it as well, if we're destroying our night skies by the hundreds of thousands of mega constellation satellites that we're about to put up there, well, Elon Musk and his cohorts are putting up there, if we're gonna lose access to our night skies, where else are we gonna get them? Well, we may have to go to the moon or Mars to see the night sky as humanity has experienced it for most of its existence. So I would argue there are very strong environmental values and these are going to be destroyed unless a case is made for them. So this was kind of the motivation between writing the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon. And it's not that we expect giving the moon uh, the potential of legal personality or uh, the, the ability to assert its own rights will stop anybody going to the moon or mining the moon or doing any of these things. But for us, it provides a counter to that very dominant discourse that the moon is there for us to use as we wish. So uh, I'm, if I've got time, I'm just going to read one or two of the rights of the moon as we articulated them. So the moon possesses fundamental rights which arise from its existence in the universe, including the right to exist, persist and continue its vital cycles unaltered, unharmed and unpolluted by human beings, the right to maintain ecological integrity and the right to remain forever a peaceful celestial entity unmarred by human conflict or warfare. So those are pretty simple things. Uh, but now that we've written them, now that they're in existence, they have to be taken account of. So, so while we don't expect the entire space industry to adopt this Declaration of the Rights of the Moon, we do expect that they will now have to engage with that. They will have to make an argument about why it is okay to destroy the ecological integrity of the moon and how that affects the course of action remains to be seen. But for me, it's very important to have this document in existence and, and you can find it uh, if you just search for Declaration of the Rights of the Moon and, and you can even... Um, uh, leave a signature to indicate you support it if you would like to do that. 
Merci beaucoup, Alice. Je voulais qu'on puisse évoquer cette déclaration des droits de la Lune parce que. Elle a... Thank you very much, Alice. I really wanted just to talk about this declaration on the rights of the Moon because there hasn't been much talk about this in France, not much commentary on this in France or elsewhere. And I think it's a very interesting approach. And you've just explained the basis to this declaration on the rights of the Moon. And this really echoes what we were saying earlier on with Kim Stanley Robinson. And it shows that taking an interest in the Moon as an object, a, a, a celestial body, and taking an interest in the rights of the moon, not necessarily from a strictly legal point of view, but just to recognize uh, the specific characteristics of the moon and to think about what the moon might become in future if we continue in the same way. So obviously, it's a very special exercise. It, it, it makes us think about how we inhabit the Earth today and um, what we do with the Earth and uh, 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 all of these changes that uh, we are provoking. So we have a few minutes left if uh, you have any questions for either of our guests this evening. So there's a roving mic in the room. Don't hesitate to ask any questions if you have any questions either for Isabelle or for Alice. Uh, so I think it would be a great pleasure for them to answer your questions. Et préciser à qui vous posez la question ou si la question. And could you say who, who your question is for, or if it's for both of our guests? Don't hesitate to say so. Good evening. My name is Adrian. I have a question for both guests this evening. So I wanted to know, uh, and this is to link up with the previous guest this evening, if, if there are any works of fiction which have inspired you in your work. Oh, that's a, a very simple question. Are there any works of fiction which have inspired you in your work? Maybe, Adrian, could you expand on that? question, or maybe I can expand on the question if you allow me to do so. I, I'd like to know if you have a dialogue with any authors of fiction, because I was very struck earlier on, Alice, uh, when uh, Kim was talking, and Kim cited you on several occasions. And apparently, he knows your work, he knows your approach, and I would like to ask you if you have any uh, relations with these authors of uh, fiction, and also the same question applies to Isabel. I don't want to be discreet about this or put you in a difficult situation, but maybe Isabel or Alice, who wants to go first? Alice, maybe. Okay. Um, uh, someone who's been involved, a science fiction author, with the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon is, is the Canadian writer Carl Schroeder, who has talked a lot about um, uh, entities which we consider normally to be inanimate as, as having rights and also uh, being incorporated uh, into economies, like th th these ideas that, that we have uh, made invisible the contribution of things like water and air, oxygen, Uh, to um, terrestrial economies and that, that these need to be made visible and in some cases, uh, like forests or rivers, be given rights. So, so um, thinking about Carl Schroeder's ideas has been quite important for me and uh, the other others involved in the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon, who I should acknowledge, I won't name them all here, but it was a, a, a group work. And I think um, archaeologists certainly read science fiction all the time, and I know space scientists do too. And it's uh, that kind of, um, uh, you know, the, the mixture and melding of ideas um, that, in, you know, inevitably influences you, even if you're not conscious or can, can't pinpoint a particular work or a particular sentence that gave you some idea. I think now more than ever, science fiction writers are... are making the words and the concepts we need to describe these futures and these new worlds. So, so it's, it's really important to be incorporating and conscious of the influences of fiction and the uh, insights and advances we get from considering fiction in how we're thinking about the future. À vous, Isabelle. Oui, alors... Um... Well, let me just say that I'm rather, I've got my feet on the ground, generally speaking. I must admit, I have quite read quite a few science fiction books, despite the fact that I'm not necessarily always drawn to this type of fiction. But what I'm interested in is what science fiction tells us about the different approaches. If you ask me to talk about one book in particular, I would maybe mention the three-bodied problem. It's a science fiction book. It's a Chinese science fiction book that has been translated, one of the very few. And it's really, really interesting because the way in which it presents the relationship that exists between the earth, and I'm not going to spoil the story because there are 300 volumes of 750 pages each, so I'll let you read it. But I must say it's extremely interesting 
to see exactly how the basic idea is that the earth has to remain hidden. And it's something that is so different from everything we read in the other novels, in the other science fiction novels. Of course, there's all the standard science fiction that I find interesting, that about the imaginary regimes that we could send to other planets or that we could find. But these are all different forms of utopia that lots of Russian authors wrote about before the Russian Revolution. Um, I don't think I've ever been particularly inspired by science fiction. Nevertheless, reading about science fiction to me is very, very interesting because it shows all of the different imaginative triggers. And we've talked about this to a certain extent. There's a strange game that is sometimes played between the different engineers and the people who perform science and who go in for complex techniques and the policies that they have to then take on board. They, they have, they, the scientists want to make tangible things, but then you have the media, for example, that grab hold of the subject in mid-flight and transform it completely. And then you've got the general public that end up with a highly digested product that is actually quite far away from what was the original subject. We've talked about the fact that space has been highly militarized at certain times. And sometimes I think we have rather an imprecise representation of certain things in our world. But I think what is important to ask ourselves about what we want to do with the Earth, Earth and with space, and maybe we can do it with our standard thinking processes without needing science fiction. Thank you. Do we have another question? I think I have two people, two hands that are raised. So in order, in the order in which people raise their hands, over to you, sir. Good evening, everybody. I have two questions for our guests. The first question concerns the position of Europe in relation to the conquest of space. And the second question is, to what extent can new technologies help us in this conquest? Thank you. So, one question on the position of Europe, so that's a geopolitical question, and then a more technological question on new technologies and the role that they can play in the spatial space, conquest of space. Isabel on Europe, maybe. Well, I would say that Europe, in terms of its position, Europe is a major space power when it comes to the scientific aspects and the know-how from a technolo technological perspective. We've placed a probe on a comet. We've got an awful lot of know-how, a lot of technological and scientific know-how in Europe. However, we also have another major capacity in Europe, that is cooperation, spatial European cooperation. This is um, a know-how that we've developed and the European agencies, I believe, cooperate more than any others in the world. Maybe it's because we've got quite a neutral position and because we go for a multilateral approach. That's a strong point. You've got the weak points as well, which is the fact that everything that revolves around space generally tends to lean towards certain priorities such as sovereignty, national safety and security, leadership, soft power, and so on and so forth. In Europe, we have to admit that systematically what we never have is um, in day-to-day -day areas, it's what we what we don't have in other areas. We ce we celebrate Thomas Pesquet, for example. The British celebrate the, the names of their astronauts. The Americans celebrate theirs. And just this example illustrates that we find it very difficult to identify ourselves from a European perspective. Mm. Um, and this means that things will be very difficult in the future. In the future, another weakness that we have is if you look at the United States. Um, so much money has been invested by the state since 1961, because today the United States, I believe, spent um, over double the amount that all of the space powers around the world spent put together. And this has been the case for the last 60 years. So American investments in space are enormous compared with the rest of the world. So, of course, there are going to be private stakeholders that are going to come along with their technologies off the shelf, off the shelf technologies or technology that they can reuse, such as Elon Musk's. But there's basically a massive investment that has been achieved in the space sector, but not in Europe. And also, if you look at India or China, they don't have any infrastructures when it comes to ob observing space or the telecom sector, but we're quite good in Europe. We don't necessarily need uh, a telecom satellite to be able to connect to the internet, um, whereas in China, it's an absolute necessity. So you have some countries for which the 
space policy is not even discussed. And we in Europe, we need to succeed to find our niche. And it's rather difficult. Now, before I pass the floor over to Alice, it means, does it not, that Europe, technologically speaking, is way ahead of the crowd. But the technological mastery is not an automatic uh, door to enabling us to have political and geographic power. No, Alice, you too, of course, you can answer both questions if you wish, both the question pertaining to Europe, but also maybe concerning other powers that be, because I know that you're very attentive in attempting to understand exactly how new powers or new sensitivities can express themselves through the conquest of space, and also in relation to the question of technology. Do feel free to answer. I think what Isabel said is fascinating in terms of Europe finding its identity as a as, uh, player in the space world. And of course, back in the 1960s, uh, Australia and uh, the European Launcher Development Organization um, worked very closely together. Australia was part of that whole international cooperation. Um, and uh, hopefully one of these days we might rejoin, we might join the European Space Agency. So I think this question of identity um, is really uh, interesting, especially when you're up against countries like the US who have, have developed such a strong one. Um, and, and there are ways in which this can be expressed in material culture as well. So I find that stuff um, quite interesting. Um, but thinking about the, the technological uh, issues, so Something I've learned in my years in space industry is that aerospace engineering can be incredibly innovative, but also incredibly conservative and traditional. People tend to do things the way they've done them before, the way they did them the last time. Uh, and, and, you know, there's all this new space uh, uh, discourse around disruption and blah, 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 all that stuff. So it's a really interesting kind of ecosystem, I think. But some of the technologies that we're going to need to develop are new methods of propulsion, uh, particularly if we're going to do any active orbital debris removal. And there are lots of people working on uh, new methods of propulsion, you know, for example, um, plasma engines, ones that actually use old space junk as their fuel. And so this gets us around the problem of having to take huge quantities of fuel into space. So I think new methods of propulsion are a key technology um, that we'll hopefully see some breakthroughs through in, in the next decade. In terms of going to other planets, I mean, it's extraordinary because there's so much talk of, you know, going to live on Mars and uh, orbiting habitats and being on the surface of the moon. But there has never been on Earth yet a completely successful enclosed system where you don't ever introduce any additional resources, water, oxygen, whatever it is. Even on a small scale, we haven't really successfully done that. So we're going to need a lot of work on sort of ecological, biological, and also microbiological. Kim uh, referred to the issues of the human body's microbiome. Uh, so we have so much research on these fronts to do before people can live in space on a more permanent basis. Uh, growing plants in space, again, you, you can do it. You can grow lettuce on the International Space Station, but whether you can repeatedly grow lettuce for decades um, in a closed environment and, and have that work, that's something we don't know. And I think the, the good part about all of this is that it kind of opens space up to non-traditional professions. Uh, so everybody doesn't have to be an aerospace engineer uh, in order to be making some contribution to, to putting together all those pieces of the puzzle uh, that will enable humans to be in space uh, long longer term. So whether we should do that or not is another question. But in terms of technology, there's still so much we don't have that we don't know. And in some ways, that's kind of exciting, thinking about the science that's going to come out of space in the coming decades. Merci beaucoup. Et ça sera la dernière question que nous... Thank you very much. And that, this will be the last question that we will take. Over to you. Hello, my name is Gaëtan. I wanted to know whether there are any prospective studies concerning the impact, the geographic impact on the Earth about looking to going into space. I'm talking about the launch pads, for example. We know that the launch pads that are used are the result of a colonial heritage. Look at Kourou or look at Kazakhstan. I'm wondering, are there any prospective studies about the future conflicts, for example, 
that could occur potentially um, close to these sites that are advantageous for heading into space, Isabel. Oh, I would tend to say that currently there's a wide variety of new bases, new launch pads that are currently being developed and deployed. It's true that it's within the scope of private projects, small launch pads, small bases, and sometimes even barges that do enable us to perform temporary launches. And the basic idea is that now what we might look for above all is to have a launch pad that is as accessible as possible, as cheap as possible, in the knowledge that the technology now means that being closer to the equator to make energy savings for the geostationary launch, it doesn't have the same value as in the past, because now we use plasma engines on the satellites, that means that we can travel around more easily and choose the orbit more easily. So I'd simply say that the criteria nowadays for a base is for it to be on your territory. The Russians, for example, um, after having depended on Kazakhstan for their base, they're now finishing off the development of their own specific base. So it's true, there is this idea whereby we say it's important to be on one's own home ground, on one's territory, if possible as well, to provide jobs in the industry. Elon Musk has the private base in Kachuka, but this causes many problems because the Texan government is providing support, even if they're damaging a nature reserve. And the, the reasons they're giving are that we're creating jobs. In Australia, there's the base, uh, Alice was referring to this base, and currently it's not really used, but there are new projects for bases in Australia. So let's say that for a space launch pad, you need an area where there's not too too much around it. It has to be protectable. And basically, this, this kind of land infrastructure really does depend on the business plans of these famous private companies we've been talking about. The UK, England and Scotland, I think they've got something like 10 projects for bases at the current time. But obviously, we will never see 10 bases in the UK over the next few years. Um, so Portugal has one, Spain has one. I repeat, there are many, many projects for these kinds of national bases. Alice, possibly, would you like to make a few comments on this question of the launch pads? I know that you're very sensitive to this question of the multiplication of the number of projects in geographic spaces that weren't originally the spaces chosen by the great powers that be for launching. I think Isabel's right. It's no longer acceptable to sort of look to former colonial territories to, to put unpopular or dangerous installations. And a factor in uh, many of these spaces being perceived as empty and therefore low risk and safer has been colonial processes which involve the decimation of local populations. So I think things have changed a lot in that regard, certainly in Australia. So we have the Woomera um, launch site, which is still used for mainly for defence, but we've got three new launch sites being developed and they're being done very much uh, in conjunction with local traditional owners um, who have to fully approve uh, the, their existence and all of the process along the way and there are requirements about uh, having local jobs and all that kind of thing and there are uh, agreements in place uh, with the traditional owners and the native title owners so that's a big change that's that's very different uh, I, I also have been in touch with um, some researchers who are going back to Kuru and uh, Peter Redfield the uh, US anthropologist did a huge amount of work on the social impacts of building Kuru back in the 1960s. Uh, but now there are people looking at this again, like looking what are the longer term impacts of having a rocket launch site uh, located in on your land, on your country, within your community, and what that means for Indigenous people particularly. So I think there's ongoing work around these questions and the sensibilities of the current age are very, very different to what they were in the past. And that's a good thing. Merci beaucoup. Il est 22 heures. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is now uh, 10.30. We're going to close for this evening. Isabel, thank you very much. And also Alice Gorman, thank you very much to you from Adelaide. Thank you for being present with us for this very, very interesting debate. We will continue, of course, we'll continue our discussion on the habitability of this um, outer space area. Let me stress that, as is the case every evening, the bookshop Archipel is present with us 
on the spot here. And notably, you can find a certain number of books that have been translated. Kim Stanley Robinson's book, um, Alice Gorman's book, Space Junk, has not been translated into French yet, unfortunately. But you can also meet Alice on Twitter, where she has an account in the name of Dr. Junk Space. Do feel free to follow Alice. And you have the atlas as well of the satellites that Isabel co-managed, co-directed a few years ago, and it's still available. And it's a pioneering book on the question of the analysis of um, extraterrestrial space. So if you can't find it here tonight, you can find it in all of the good bookshops that will take your orders. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Alice, for having been with us so early in the morning from Adelaide. It's a great pleasure. We look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> and the School of the Anthropocene is continuing. So have a wonderful evening, all of you. Thank you. Thank you.